The Unshackled Waves, Episode 60. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms, here for this week's review episode, and I'm joined once again by my co-editor-in-chief of The Unshackled, Sukath Fernando. Welcome again. Thanks, Tim, and hello, everyone. Well, it's been a week of terror, both here and around the world. Of course, it started uh, last week with yet another terrorist attack in uh, England, this time on the London Bridge where three attackers uh, mowed down and stabbed uh, people on a, on a Saturday night. They, were, they killed uh, seven people. All of the attackers were thankfully killed. And this week in Melbourne, we saw a terrorist attack in the uh, effluent suburb of Brighton, where a, a refugee, a uh, Somalian, uh, held a, a woman hostage and killed uh, killed a worker in an apartment complex, shot three uh, police and rang Channel 7 to say that he was doing it in the name of ISIS. So just days after we heard there was yet another attack in England, of course, there was the Manchester Arena bombing less than two weeks ago. Uh, terror was on our doorstep. And just so you think we're, we're, not foc- uh, we're only focusing on Western terrorism, there was a terrorist attack in Kabul, Afghanistan uh, last week, which killed 90 people. So it has been a week of uh, global terror. Of course, uh, these attacks follow a w- uh, w- oh, just over a week after the Asia bus uh, Duncan Lewis appeared before Senate estimates uh, and uh, when questioned by Pauline Hanson said they don't make inquiries based on people's religion and there was zero evidence uh, linking uh, refugees to terrorism. Of course, the one in Melbourne, the terrorist was a refugee. And uh, even though we're seeing these attacks occurring in greater frequency, uh, our leaders are still dismissing uh, Pauline Hanson and Donald Trump saying we can't possibly consider a Muslim ban and, oh, you know, we mustn't demonise all Muslims and we must work with the moderate Muslim community. And it's what I've noticed is that also even right-wingers are beginning to uh, virtue signal on this issue. I mean, the hashtags pray for whatever, love is love, and they're widely mocked. But now the, the favourite thing from right-wingers to say is we need to talk about Islam, but oh, we can't possibly uh, consider a uh, Muslim immigration ban. Of course, despite the recent terror attacks in the UK, the, uh, their election is still going ahead. Uh, this Thursday, 8th of June 2017, we will know Friday morning Australian time what the result is. So Theresa May, it's fair to say she's had a poor campaign. There's been plenty of gaffes. And Jeremy Corbyn, uh, he was given no chance at the beginning of the campaign. He's performed quite well and he's narrowed the gap in the polls. Uh, though it still looks like the Conservatives will scrape over the line, even though uh, uh, Corbyn has said some good things, even though he is a raging communist, uh, it's we, we still believe that Theresa May is the better choice. Now, before we uh, start discussing the topics, I just want to say that the sound quality of today's podcast won't be the best because where Sukuth is, it's raining uh, in Sydney, which is affecting the internet signal. So uh, apologies for that in advance. Yeah, sorry, it's just raining here um, today and yeah, it's, the signal is quite low. So, you know, you might be a bit fuzzy, but just bear with us. <laughs> Yeah, it'll still be a high quality discussion, we can guarantee. Yeah, yeah. But I thought I'd start with today because it's it's been in the news the last 24 hours, the uh, attempted assault of Andrew Bolt uh, by leftist thugs. It actually occurred outside a book launch, which uh, The Unshackled was co-hosting with our friends at Connor Court Publishing. Uh, it was Andrew Bolt was there to launch the book, The, the Art of the Impossible, uh, which is a blog uh, history of the election of Donald Trump as president. And it was by economist uh, Stephen Cates. Now, I was the MC for the event, so I was quite nervous because there was 
uh, 60 people in, uh, in attendance. So I wanted to put on a, a good show for oh, not just the attendees, but also for the speakers as well. And so we're all waiting for Andrew to arrive. So so that we could uh, get the launch started and it's it's not not every day that uh, you have Andrew Bolt appear at at your event so yeah, it was I, was I was quite nervous and then um, a, a person who's a regular attendees at, at these events and is a fan of the Unshackled came up and said uh, Andrew's been assaulted outside they, they, they tried to punch him and it's my heart sank and we, we all rushed downstairs and uh, they, they'd already uh, run off uh, the restaurant staff uh, had gone out there. Andrew uh, had gone to the bathroom to, to clean himself up, but uh, the launch still went on. Andrew uh, Andrew emerged. Uh, his his clothes were were stained with red and blue blue dye, and uh, and so he delivered his uh, launch speech as promised. And uh, we we then learnt that it was actually the uh, attackers who had come off second best. Andrew had fought back, which uh, left us thugs. They're they're not actually used to to people fighting back, as we saw in, in the Battle of Berkeley. Uh, so Andrew yeah talked about the obviously the new fa fascism because of, of what a what have just happened. He still gave a, a sterling speech, which was pretty uh, heroic under under the circumstance. And the the rest of the launch uh, went uh, without incident. Uh, plenty of people bought the book, and I also encourage uh, our listeners as well to to buy the book from our friends at Connor Court Publishing. The uh, the police were were called, and um, Andrew Bolt here he released the the CCTV footage on his show last night to, to say if you recognise any of these attackers, uh, please please call uh, the North Melbourne Police. So Andrew, yeah, I was, uh, I was quite frightened when I first heard it happen, but no, Andrew was, he, 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 he came out of it uh, strong and, um, but it's, yeah, it's just, a, it's just a shame because I have, I myself felt uh, a bit bad that it happened because I thought because it was a public publicly accessible event like maybe I shouldn't have promoted it uh, so, so much but but then, but then again people like Andrew should be able to attend whatever event they they want to in a free society and not have to have security or have a have a secret venue but it's also made me consider that perhaps the unshackled is attracting the attention of Antifa or the Socialist Alternative or some other uh, leftist organization and they they saw this uh, this event with, with Andrew Bolt as the as the speaker as the perfect time to time to strike but uh, Andrew luckily was uh, prepared for the the fight and uh, heroically uh, fought them off which were, which which was a, f a good result wasn't it Zuka? yeah I think um, I'm happy he fought them off and he was able to actually you know um, respond to them in some way using their own tactics, give them, give them a taste of their own medicine. Um, I think firstly it shows that um, the left is just incapable of um, actually engaging with us through the use of ideas or through the use of debate. They're sort of now using violence um, and aggressiveness. So they're using physical attacks in order to actually win the debate. Um, and that just reflects badly on them. And I think that just shows us what they really are and that they really are incompetent when it comes to the actual ideas. And that they know they, they're losing the ideas or they're losing um, the actual debate with their superficialities, with their, with their ignorance. Um, so they're switching to physical attacks. And I think that's just, it, it's all the frost with, you should show that we are the ones who have the moral high ground. Uh, well, they well they consider us on the right as evil, and that our, our ideas are, are violent in themselves, and so uh, that's why the left are justified at using violence against us. I mean, there's that infamous video saying that misgendering somebody is an act of violence. I mean, this is how ridiculous it's gotten. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, let's remember there are, there are people who think that um, actually checking out women, that a man checking out a woman is rape. You know, they think that a man eyeing a woman because she looks good, perfectly natural for a man to do, and for a woman to look at a man, but they think it's rape. Um, so, you know, they've gotten to this, I'm, I'm not saying that the entire left is like that, but the left has reached that level. So, and, and that just shows that they are unable to actually keep themselves reasonable, that they're unable to actually um, sort of, you know, you know, engage with us in a constructive way. So, you know, they can't resort to violence. And I just hope that the thing is they're expecting us to sort of not 
respond the same way because you know we are if there was a leftist and if there's a right wing person i'm pretty sure the right wing person would win if it was a physical fight because the left tends to be physically weaker anyway um so you know just it's, it's it's their loss yeah, the, the left uh, for years they've gotten away with unprovoked violence, but uh, now the right are actually fighting back. And I mentioned Berkeley before; that was the first time where the right actually fought back. And now we have uh, Andrew Bolt fighting back as well. And um, yeah, as I mentioned before, it's obviously the the left are, n are now paying uh, attention to what the Unshackled does. But we're not going to be deterred about you know, what what the left will will do to us. We knew what we were getting ourselves into when we we started the Unshackled, and it's just a uh, too important mission to to just uh, recall from. So if if, if the left want to come and attack us, we're prepared for the fight. Yeah, but I find it quite flattering that they are responding to us, and they actually are paying attention to us in the first place, uh, and that they are responding to us. You know, it shows that we actually do have an actual impact, and that we do have um, influence in the political sphere, um, because they are able to see what we do. Um, you know, I think uh, it's funny because I feel like we have been the ones who were tolerant um, of people. They thought we were intolerant. They thought we were, you know, just racist or sexist or whatever. But it's, I think we were the ones. I know we were the ones who were tolerant of them, um, and we had enough. They've gone too far, and now they're taken to the physical level, and we're going to fight back, um, and you know, bring it on, because you know we can win that. If if they want to get into the physical level, then we can win that. Yeah, definitely. So we're going to uh, ca carry on, and uh, definitely not going to be deterred by by the yeah. left. But uh, enough talking about uh, us, let's actually move on to well, more serious acts of violence, which of course is terrorism. Now, it's you know, all these recent attacks, they're all occurring during the Islamic, uh, well, I guess you'd call it, holiday period of Ramadan. Yeah. And so there yeah. was a video by the, the rebels, Faith Goldie, where she actually went through the, the, the stats uh, well, the death toll after the uh, first 10 days of Ramadan. So it's over 600 dead uh, f and 55 terrorist attacks in 17 countries. So ISIS prom promised a deadly Ramadan and they've certainly delivered. I think, um, you know, this is Islam, you know, it's full glory, I think. This is what Islam is. Um, and the fact that they've aligned their acts with Ramadan just goes to show that Islam is a violent religion. I mean, these these attacks are supported by the Quran. Um, you know, this is Islam. ISIS is Islam, you know. Um, and so, you know, the fact that it, 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 they're using Ramadan um, and it, the I just hope people are able to see that there's a connection between these two. I hope finally people are able to actually realize that there is a connection since it is happening in Ramadan. And that, that's a hint. Um, but, you know, it just shows that they want to declare war on us and you know, destroy us as, as, as much as they can. Um, and they're going to use any means possible. Um, and that is a huge concern. Yeah, well, the, the main... Uh, of uh, main attack that I mentioned in the introduction was the the London uh, bridge attack, and uh, it was uh, a lot of people have pointed out that after the Manchester Arena attack, the the message is just carry on like before, you know, show the terrorists that we aren't afraid, and that's what people were doing in London on the Sunday yeah. night, carrying on as before, and seven of them yeah. died. Uh, there was over, I think, 20 injured, uh, people stabbed in the face. I mean, yeah, that worked out well, just carrying on as before. That is horrible. I mean, you know, people were stabbed in the face. That means they probably are disfigured for the rest of their lives. I mean, no one is, the media isn't focusing on those details. The media is just saying that it's normal. It seems normal. The media is just saying that, you know, they were stabbed, they were killed, let's say, you know, they aren't focusing on the actual details. Um, I've seen the photos. I've seen what, what it actually looks like. I know um, that this religion, that these, in, these terrorist attacks are just, you know, they're just, you know, satanic in many ways, um, because it's just, you know, ruining the entire society, the entire civilization we have built. And it's funny, because they're saying that we should carry on, and we've been doing that for how many years now? Um, and it's the same all over again. You have the hashtags, you have, you, you've seen the memes, you have the hashtags, you have the profile filters, you have the, the, the songs or the candle, candle light celebration or what they have. You have the concerts and the celebrities, and then you know, just wait for the next one. And that's been going over and over and over again for, for, for a long time. And 
the, the funny thing is that people aren't realizing any connection still or any correlation between Islam and terrorism, despite the fact that, let's say, you know, 118 out of 122 people imprisoned in the UK for terrorism are Muslims. Um, but still, people aren't seeing any correlation. And of course, one of the attackers was known to uh, UK counterterrorism authorities. Uh, he was foreign born, born in Pakistan. So obviously, there's the connection there between uh, immigration and terrorism. Mm -hmm. And he was also actually featured on a UK TV show called The Jihadi yeah. Next Door, where he boasted about yeah. uh, how he extremist he was. Yeah, I actually, when I found that out, I actually, I didn't know that TV show existed. And I, when I found that out, that out, you know, I was just completely baffled. You know, why are why is it that we are seeing t reality TV shows or documentaries about terrorists or charities, and this stuff still happens? I mean, they should be using those TV shows um, to try and take them down, to try and arrest them, or or something. But it, it's just surprising, it's shocking, um, to to see that we have TV shows about it, but we don't have any um, actual programs or any arrest or any effective handling of those terrorists at all. And, you know, Theresa May's statement after, uh, afterwards saying that, uh, saying that uh, we've been, you know, too tolerant of, it, of extremism and we need to crack down like it was it was better, but it was still not good enough. Yeah. I mean, I watched uh, of one of the UK's finest uh, columnists and commentators, Katie Hopkins on Fox yeah. News, and yeah. and she basically said, Theresa May should have said, never again. And basically everyone on the terror watch list should be you know, round, rounded up and imprisoned or deported if they can. Well, it's very hard for the UK to deport them at the moment because uh, they, uh, they're still under the jurisdiction of the European Human Rights Commission, which... Uh, <laughs> Well, which is more concerned about the human rights of terrorists and uh, yeah. murderers rather than the the actual victims. So basically, it's it's still a a wet newspaper style uh, response from Theresa May, and, and it's basically. And I heard Nigel Farage say this as well that he doesn't you know favour you know internment as it's called, but he's getting mighty close to thinking that as a solution. Yeah. I think, and it's same. It's the exact same thing. It's a repetition. You know, people are you know starting to virtually think about it, and they're try, they're making up all these features uh, for what? You know, Theresa May. Again, I guess it is better, as you said. You know, she made a better statement um, in comparison to other attacks, but there is no real solution being used. There is no practical solution. Um, you know, and as you mentioned, the European Human Rights Commission, that's again, again they're taking this concept of compassion and kindness to a, to a, a harmful level. They're making those values into a in many ways. Because what they're doing is they're saying that these people who are planning to destroy our countries are planning to kill our people, rape our women, assault our children, disfigure our our friends and family. These people actually have rights. That doesn't work like that. I mean, same thing with uh, let's not let's not let's be equal. Same thing with people like and Anders Breivik in Norway. You know, people are, are fighting for his human rights um, despite everything he's done. Same problem here. You know, people, the EU Human Rights Commission is fighting for these people's human rights when they don't deserve any rights. If you are going to plan these atrocious acts, then you don't deserve any human rights. You know, you deserve to be kicked out of our country. I mean, you'll be lucky if we put you on a boat and give you a life jacket. You'll be lucky. Um, so what they should be doing is, you know, deporting all those people who are on watch lists, deporting all migrants who are criminals. Um, if, if we take them in and they respond to us by being criminals in our country, then that's just the biggest act of ingratitude ever, so you must be deported. Um, and if you are a suspected terrorist or if you do have um, any link to terrorism, then you should be deported. Um, and that's, again, I understand the counter argument is um, coming from both sides is that if you do that, then you look younger than more. Um, that's why I think it should be done in a, in a bit of a secretive way, you know, to do it in a covert way, because if we do make it too open, then it can factor. Um, but in, apart from the Muslim ban, we do need these practical solutions because homegrown terrorism is, is still a big problem.
Uh, and, and of course, uh, Donald Trump uh, made the point that what happened in uh, London, this is why, you know, the judges should, you know, s stop their judicial activism and block yeah. his uh, travel ban. And of course, Pauline Hanson uh, reaffirmed her support for a Muslim immigration ban and of course still got pillied by uh, Bill Shorten and Malcolm Turnbull. Uh, Bill Shorten called her disgusting. And, and Malcolm Turnbull saying that, you know, oh, we still need to work with the, the Muslim community. It's, uh, I made the point in a, in a couple of posts that uh, I don't recall during uh, World War II Winston Churchill saying, uh, not all Nazis, we need to work with the yeah. moderate Nazi community, yeah. and oh, we can't possibly consider a German uh, travel ban to the United Kingdom. I, I don't recall Winston Churchill saying that, yet that, uh, our, our leaders, that's what they're basically saying in 20, 2017. Yeah, I think, again, you know, here we have a situation where there are people who are saying that they want to protect us. There are people who are giving practical solutions to protect us. And then the establishment politicians um, are dismissing them. You know, it's, it's almost like well, they are brainless in many ways. Is what, they're saying. what they're practically saying is those people don't have, don't have the right to tell us that we need to be protected because the, the lives of foreigners... Um, should be prioritized of the safety and security of, of the people who live here. So they're saying that those people, the refugees, are somehow a bigger priority than the people living who are already living here, be it in Australia or the UK or anywhere in America, anywhere in the West, uh, mainly in the West. Um, and again, we have Malcolm Turnbull, you know, trying to reach out to people you shouldn't reach out. I mean, why would you reach out to a violent religion? You can't. Okay, as I said, Winston Churchill, Churchill didn't reach out to Nazis. Um, and it just doesn't make sense. It's illogical. It doesn't, doesn't make sense. You're reaching out to the enemy who will never, you know, give you that sense of reciprocity. They will never actually give pay back for doing that. Um, they'll pay back in other ways. Um, so, you know, again, ineffective leadership, ineffective politicians who aren't listening to the people, who aren't listening to common sense. Um, because it, this, I, I quite frankly don't think it's a left-right issue. I think it's a common sense issue, and everyone should be agreeing with this, because the safety and security of our people is at risk. Uh, and one of the things that's really pissed me off over the last few days is that nobody, uh, as I said, nobody takes the left wing virtue signaling seriously anymore, the pray for whatever, the, mm. the, the flag mm. filter. But I've noticed right wing people are beginning to virtue signal now saying, oh, yeah. we need to talk about Islam, linking to articles about, you know, we need to talk about Islam. And it's sort of to me, it's like, oh, you've correctly identified the problem. You know, well done. You know, we've been t uh, saying this for years. You know, you've identified the problem. What do you want? a gold star, a medal or something. But when I ask them, like, oh, so do you support a Muslim immigration ban? They're like, oh, we can't, you know, possibly consider that. So basically, you want a virtue signal that you know what the problem is, but you don't have the guts to actually offer a solution that will actually work. Yeah, again, you know, how many years has this been happening? And, you know, they're bring up this discussion now, you know, they, they want to discuss about Islam now. It's been happening for years. This, I mean, it's only been two weeks since the Manchester um, bombing, and this happened. Um, and they, now they're saying, you know, now they're saying that yeah, they want to talk about Islam. You know, how long are they actually accept a Muslim ban? That'll take like 10 years if it took them this long to actually come to a discussion about Islam. Um, you know, same thing applies to, as I said, with the politicians, with Theresa May. I mean, those policies she's saying should have, been ha should have happened years ago. I mean, she's saying that we need to um, ban Islamic... I mean, I know people may not agree with this, but she's saying we, we need to ban Islamic Facebook pages, or, sorry, ban Islamic extremist Facebook pages and ban those websites. Those should have happened years ago. I mean, even if the terrorist threat level was zero, that should have happened. No question about it. I mean, even if the threat level was zero, people who are terrorists living in our country should be deported. I mean, it doesn't matter what the level is. It doesn't matter if it's a high level or um, an imminent level or a low level. What, what, what needs to happen is deport all those people who are, who are a threat. If that's common sense. That should happen without any question. Yes, a Muslim ban may need a debate. I get that. But those other things should be undebatable. That's what I say. Because those, those are common sense. You know, banning 
extremist Facebook pages are common sense. So it's too late for that now. It's too late to do that now because that should have happened ages ago. Um, same thing with the virtual signaling. I mean, you're just, you're just trying to say that we, we need a discussion, but then you don't have a practical solution. Um, and when people do come up with a practical solution, then you dismiss them. You say it's racist or Islamophobic or whatever buzzword you have. Um, doesn't make sense. It's illogical. You are not contributing to anything. So please try and actually see some sense because or else more people will die and our civilizations will get even worse. Yeah, I, I think it's a bit late to have the discussion now. We, we need yeah. action now. I mean, this is the time exactly. of action because these attacks are going to keep happening. I mean, they're happening nearly, well, daily now. Uh, mm. this, this is how, ex uh, how extreme it's, it's getting. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the leadership of London doesn't exactly feel your uh, confidence. I mean, uh, yeah. London has a uh, Muslim mayor, Sadiq Khan, who, yeah. uh, who has taken forever to uh, admit that there is a connection between terrorism and Islam. He's, he's now said that it's a perversion of the faith. And he was also uh, triggered by, by Donald Trump criticising his leadership. Uh, no, it's because, uh, Sadiq, you're an inept leader. I mean, there's that yeah. famous quote of his that terrorism is just a uh, part and parcel of living in a big city. <laughs> um, well, Sadiq, you, you don't see these attacks in Tokyo, do you? You don't see these in Shanghai, do you? Um, large cities, um, you don't see them there because they don't have Muslims there. You know, they don't take in Muslims there. China is actually, and that's why I'm saying it's not a left-right issue. China, a communist country by name, they still have strong borders and they, they still have a strong security system. Um, and they don't, you don't see any of these major attacks in Shanghai or Beijing or Tokyo or Osaka. Um, you see them, them, them happening in places that are infiltrated by Islam, be it Western or Eastern. We saw in Mumbai, for example, in India, um, the hotel bombings there. Um, we, in, India has seen lots of terrorist attacks by Muslims, uh, and that's been happening for hundreds of years. Um, so the problem, the thing is, it just shows that you know the Muslims, if an area is infiltrated by Muslims, then the security level is un at risk. Um, terrorism level is high, um, and that is a problem. I mean, people argue, people tell me that, you know, well, those, it depends on the political, the international relations. You know, Western countries have some sort of political problem with um, Islamic countries, Middle East. Jack Corbyn said that, you know, it's because, you know, our countries are bombing their countries, our countries have political problems with their countries. That's the response. Well, it, so does India, so does China. They hate China, but do you see those happening in Shanghai? They hate Japan. Do you see those happening in Japan? You don't, because they have strong borders. Um, so Sadiq Khan is incompetent. He's a disgrace. Um, he does not, uh, London does not need a mayor. And in regards to his um, quote where he said it's a perversion of religion, no, it's not. ISIS is actual Islam. Look at the Quran. Look at your own holy book. Could the Quran support their actions? Um, you know, it, that's obvious. That's like written, Muhammad would have supported their actions. Um, so just please educate yourself about your own religion or stop lying about it. Okay, let's move on to uh, the, the attack that happened in Australia uh, uh, this past Monday, which was uh, in Brighton in, in Melbourne, uh, which is a, a, a wealthy suburb in Melbourne. So there was a, the attacker was a Somalian refugee uh, once again, the, the head of Asia was looking like a dill. Uh, he he yep. called a uh, escort and when she arrived, uh, took her hostage, uh, shot and, in an, uh, I should say, in a, an apartment complex in Brighton, shot and killed a clerk who worked in the apartment co uh, complex and uh, shot three police officers who were injured uh, before being killed himself. And so he was on parole uh, uh, after being uh, convicted and serving time for another uh, terrorist related plot he was known to counter terrorism police yet he was allowed to roam the street and commit this act and it also should be pointed out that he had a shotgun so Australia's gun laws you know obviously didn't work because he was still uh, yeah, able to, yeah. to get, uh, get the gun and of course yeah. uh, of uh, Victoria's inept uh, leadership, uh, Daniel Andrews said that, oh, he was a, a model person uh, to be out on parole. He ticked all the boxes. I was like, yeah. Are you serious? <laughs> Yeah, he basically justified why this guy was out on parole. He never said we need to review uh, parole, which he should have done after uh, the uh, man who murdered uh, Jill Ma uh, was also out on parole. Uh, he, d he also didn't 
fix anything after the Burke Street car attack early, earlier this year. So, so, so basically he said, well, you know, it's not, uh, I didn't do anything wrong. Well, you know, great, great leadership, not taking responsibility. Okay. You know, yeah. I mean, you, you said a lot of things there and I, you know, I understand the entire stupidity, you know, that has clouded over Daniel Andrews. I'll start with Daniel Andrews. Um, you know, it's, I do know that, um, I think it was today, I think he did say we need a review, but it was too little too late. I mean, today he didn't even mention it much anyway. Um, so, you know, just too little too late. Um, it, again, how can you say that it's justified to let someone have parole when they've committed such atrocious cr criminal acts. He, for example, stabbed a man twice on the leg um, and tried to rob him. He actually um, broke into a house and violently assaulted um, a father and, uh, and his daughter. Um, you know, and he, I think um, with the holes where the Ali Barracks here in Sydney, because he originally is from Sydney, um, here in Sydney, um, he tried, he was part of that plot to actually do a terrorist attack um, targeting the Hallsworthy army base in Sydney. And his role, um, it has been uncovered, was to go to Somalia or go to an Islamic country and get um, a cleric get clerical support, clerical legitimization, um, because we all know Islam is a violent religion and the Quran supports it. So he went to Somalia to get clerical um, uh, support for the, uh, the Holsworthy um, attack. It didn't happen, thankfully. Um, and the, 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 the thing is, he, uh, so news uncovered that 60 years, he needed 60 years of imprisonment in total for everything he did. So he received 60 years, but he only actually stayed there for 5.5 years, um, but although he was meant to be there for 60 years, but it's 5.5 years. And here is Daniel Andrews saying that it was justified to give someone who deserves 60 years um, in, to be in, in prison to be let out in parole. That doesn't make sense. That's not what you expect from a, from a premier. That's what you expect from a madman. Um, and that is why I'm hoping he loses um, in the next election. I'm, I'm thinking he will because of everything else he's done. Um, and it just doesn't make sense. It's pure incompetence and just goes to show that the politicians, the leftist, the, the ultra globalist politicians are just, to, are just as are responsible for these acts as the actual terrorists themselves, because these acts wouldn't have happened if they were smart and they were um, astute in terms of their immigration policies. Yeah, well, well, Daniel Andrews, like, he hasn't paid much attention to the crime wave sweeping Victoria. Yeah, exactly, and, yeah. I mean, he, he's more interested in having his uh, anti-racism <laughs> police force. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, don't you dare think, think they're a wrong thing. And, of course, he, he loves to, you know, virtue signal on all these, uh, you know, left-wing social issues. Uh, thankfully, Malcolm Turnbull is, well, he's starting to be... Uh, his rhetoric's starting to be a bit tougher, but of course he still, yeah. you know, won't won't make it. A long calls. way away. Yeah, he he's yeah. talked about uh, uh, reforming uh, parole, and it was also good news that uh, Malcolm Turnbull has cancelled the ITFA dinner that he held yeah. last year during the uh, federal election, which I believe actually you know, nearly cost him the election. He was at a table with Walid Ali, Susan Carlin, and uh, Yasmin abdel Magid. And this, I should add, was a week after the Orlando Islamist attack. So it was the worst timing, which made it even more idiotic. But uh, a year on, he seems to have learnt the lesson. I'm hoping he is learning the lesson because, you know, his position as Prime Minister is on very thin ice. He is standing on very thin ice right now um, because of his ineffective policies and his incompetence. Um, I guess it is a hard job. I should, you know, maybe it's not fair to be very harsh on him because it is a hard job being Prime Minister. There are different sides you need to um, um, cater for. Um, but, you know, you need to have a backbone in these things and you need to follow common sense and actually do something practical. Um, I'm, I am glad he's being tough and he's saying that he was, he was very angry um, at, at the fact that this person was actually let out on, on parole. Um, and it, I'm hoping he does do something about it. Daniel Andrews, however, he's more concerned, as he said, with his anti-racism, with his respectful relationships with his safe schools, rather than the safety and security of his people. Um, and let's hope let's hope people like him never get elected again because this is a good lesson for everyone um you know and let's hope pe people are smart enough so the majority are smart enough to not even consider individuals like daniel andrews ever in politics again
Oh, well, I've talked a bit about how ASIO looks really stupid now, but they are also part of the problem as well because yeah. their advice to the political leaders is like, you know, don't propose things like a Muslim immigration ban because their attitude is that we must be nice to Muslims, otherwise they'll attack us, which which is, of course, basically proves that, you know, Islam is a violent religion. It does. Um, I do want to say that I, I, I understand that sentiment, I want to say, I think it's ineffective. I understand because we do know that homegrown terrorism is a big problem, and see, see, you know, we know what Muslims are like. We know they are they have such a um, genetic almost connection to violence. Um, so you know, you know, and the, the thing is, I, I do understand that sentiment, but I think it's, that's why we need to have more tougher policies. You know, um, you are only afraid, like they're only afraid of those stances, those policies, because they don't have any other tough policy to, to respond to. Now, if you have a tough policy like deporting Muslims, and if you do so, deporting Muslims who are at least deporting those who do have a connection to terrorism, um, then if you do that in a smart way, then you can, it can be successful, I, I would say. You know, it's just the problem is the whole transparency can be a bit of an obstacle sometimes. Um, so, but if you try and do it secretly and in, in a covert manner, then maybe you could actually do, a thing, do it effectively instead of giving in to people's feelings, giving to Muslims' feelings, saying that their feelings are more important than our safety. Um, so, and that might actually save your jobs as well. And I'd also, she pointed out, I mentioned that Brighton is a rich area of Melbourne, and I should also point out it's a very white area of Melbourne. So obviously the people that are living there, they don't think that uh, they're, yeah. they're going to be the, yeah. the victims mm -hmm. of terror, but uh, yeah. the, uh, this, uh, this attack in, in their suburb, it might send a message to a lot of these inner city lefties that, you know, just because, you know, yeah. you're amongst, you know, rich middle class white people, you're not... Safer, safe either. I mean, I live in a, a uh, I would say, a white part of Melbourne, and I, I wouldn't, you know, say we're hundred percent safe either. You know, you're right. Um, I think part of the problem is that's why I'm getting a bit more understanding of these inner city lefty in a way when it comes to migration, at least, um, because they live in their own bubble. I don't think we should be understanding. There's like, it, it's there's no excuse for how ignorant they are. I think, well, I mean, understanding, I'm not accepting their opinions. I'm not saying they are right. What I'm saying is that I can see, because I, I at least at least three days a week, um, I travel between Eastern Sydney and Western Sydney. I live in the West. Um, it's not that unsafe, I would say, because my area is mainly um, Filipino dominated, so mainly Catholic, very traditional Filipino people who I'm very happy with. Um, now, the thing is, I do travel between the East and the West, and the difference is just completely, it, 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 it's eye-opening, um, because it's un, I think it's, it's a bit, um, I get how they may be a very um, sort of open to migration in a, in a way because they live in very white dominated parts, as you said. So they aren't very under, they, they themselves aren't very understanding of the other areas. They are stuck in a bubble. Um, it, it's almost like a physical, a physical sort of in geographical echo chamber that they're stuck in. Um, so I get that they're not, they're not exposed to all these you know, real life things in ways, you know, m many of them, I don't, I don't know if they watch the media or not, but they don't, I don't think they're exposed to. So I get that. Um, but that's why we need to, that's why these events show that, you know, no one is safe from anything. It doesn't matter where, where you live. Um, and ultimately, it's just, ultimately, I hope that they, they do start understanding of our perspective because now they know what we're talking about. Now they know that, you know, they've been living in this bubble and that bubble has been sort of infiltrated by someone and that area has... Um, seen it's been a very horrific terrorist attack, um, and I hope this opens up their eyes and opens up their mind and lets them see the light, lets them see the fact that we have a point, that we are right. Um, so let's hope it does have a good constructive result, a constructive um, sort of impact on the political discourse in this country. Well, if that concludes our oh, summary of uh, the week of terror. I'm sure we'll talk about terrorism again when uh, the next terrorist attack happens. The next attack, yeah. Uh, we, yeah. Which it will. Uh, we, we can yeah. be sure of that. Maybe we'll have to, in the future, uh, have to do a, a show just reviewing the just week of terrorism. Yeah, exactly. We, we would, yeah, yeah. So, but we're actually going to talk about uh, well, some other important news, but it's actually connected to 
uh, mm. terrorism as well, that despite the terror attacks in uh, the UK, their general election will be going ahead, uh, Theresa May said. Uh, now, as I said, despite a lacklustre campaign from Theresa May, she's still predicted to win, but have a narrow majority, which is not what she went to the election for. She wanted a super majority. Uh, she's yeah. had plenty of gaffes. There's been unpopular policies such as the dementia tax, uh, which means that... Um, uh, older people are going to have to pay more for their their treat uh, their treatment when they're when they're older, and uh, Jeremy Corbyn has you know despite yeah despite the fact that he is you know, basically a communist he's performed quite well. Yeah, um, I think again I think just th that last thing you said where he's performed well it's very it's very scary isn't it? Um, but I think if you look at it. Um, it just shows that it's the human nature thing. People are wanting to see some change. Um, so, you know, I think it's the same thing that applies to the, a more local perspective like the Western Australia election or in America, the Trump election. Um, you know, people want to change. And I think, I think we are seeing that, that aspect of human nature coming in again. Um, now, the, the thing is, I, I, am, I have been very disappointed with um, the Conservatives' performance in the polls. I have seen various polls that show that um, the margin is now very narrow. I've seen other polls that show that it's very high. I'm not sure which one to trust. I'm not sure which one's correct. I've seen these on particular Facebook groups that I've um, been going through. Um, and some of them show that the conservatives are on, well on their way to a landslide. Not sure if those are correct. Not sure if it's actual fake news or something. Um, I'm hoping they're true. Uh, I think the problem is Theresa May didn't really do intelligent things during the campaign. She had some of her decisions, some of her actions weren't very smart, like how she um, almost retreated from or boycotted that BBC TV debate, oh, I think it was BBC, that TV debate where different people from different parties were there and she sent um, another representative in there, I forgot the lady's name, but it was a lady and she sent her there instead of going there herself and she got a huge, she, she was battered for that um, and that was that was very bad PR, I don't know why she did that, um, you know, she has been attacked a lot, um, I realised that their elections are actually much much more, um, it gets much more uglier than he here. I realize because she's been attacked a lot by by all sides, um, and you can s see in her face that she's kind of losing it um, in many ways. So I think I'm, I'm hoping they do win. Jeremy Corbyn, a communist, he's been involved with terrorism. I know that. Um, you know he has support. He has sympathised with the IRA, with the Irish cause, um, and the fact that she's getting so much support is completely worrying. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, there's been a campaign uh, to show people of Britain that they actually agree with Jeremy Corbyn on a lot of issues. I saw this video of like these Vox Fox, they say, oh, do you support all these things? Well, you support Jeremy Corbyn. And so they're sort of like, oh, yeah. And mm. so I think that's yeah. why he's been gaining ground in the, the polls. Yeah, on foreign policy, he is half right. I mean, it would be better if yeah. Yeah, the UK wasn't involved in all these, uh, you know, foreign entanglements over in the, the Middle East. He's, he's criticized NATO. And he's also said that taxpayers should be able to opt out of the, the military which is he's actually supporting like the anarcho-capitalist point of view, which uh, he, it seems he's anarcho-capitalist on the military, but just not on everything else in the economy. He wants to take every, uh, forcibly take everyone's money to fund everything else. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a really important point. You know, I've mentioned this to people and I've realized that um, the problem is, you know, it, we're at some sort of crossroads. It's a, it's a sort of crossroad. The problem is um, people are pointing out problems um, with the Conservatives on the same front in regards to using taxpayer money for particular things. Um, now, now, the thing is, you realise that the Conservatives haven't exactly been on the moral high ground um, on that front either, because the Conservatives, while they don't distribute that money to other people, they still support corporate welfare. They have been uh, undertaking corporate welfare programs, and that is still a problem. That's just, a, that's probably, that's almost as bad, or just as bad as what the communists want, as what the socialists want. So when I tell them that, you know, why do you support a, a party that wants to, you know, take people's money and distribute to other people? Why do you want to do that to, you know, people who've hard, earned their money by working hard and now they, they have their money taken back um, and they're, they're like well it's the same thing with the conservatives and they're doing the same thing with corporate welfare so we'd rather we'd rather vote for the person who's going to give it to people than give it to companies and I was like you know I don't agree with you I'd rather I'd rather companies but I get your point 
um, because you know the conservatives aren't exactly on a moral high ground on that front. In regards to foreign affairs um, and international relations, uh, I do think yeah he does, he has a point. The, the intervention is a problem. You know we need to see a bit more of that isolationism. You know that that conservative isolationism we expect from Western countries. Um, and the thing is, intervening has resulted in in um, in encouraging terrorism. I wouldn't say it directly has, but it, ha it has encouraged terrorism. Um, but again, his perspective, I mentioned earlier, his perspective that this has resulted in terrorism isn't exactly very correct because, you know, as I said, you know, Muslims hate India, Muslims hate China. They don't, um, uh, you, you know, interfere much in other places. That's because Muslims hate anyone who they think is an obstacle. They want to take over India for a long time and they did, they were successful for a while, but they, they lost and India was taken back. Um, same thing with China, for example. They wanted to take over China, but they couldn't. They never could. Um, so, you know, why are they, um, have, why do they have problems with China and India as well? So, you know, you're logic ultimately doesn't, is half right, but doesn't always make sense. Yeah, the, the other half of the problem is, of course, Islam itself. Now, uh, the conventional yeah. wisdom is that terror attacks uh, benefit the right, but this might not be the case. I mean, we saw a terrorist attack in, in Paris uh, a couple of weeks before their presidential election, let, uh, yet Macron, uh, the globalist, still won in a landslide. And it's also yeah. worth pointing out that in this election, there's actually no you know, right-wing alternative, there's no Pauline Hanson yeah. or Donald Trump-style mm. uh, yeah. politician. I mean, Farage has retired, and since he, he left, uh, UKIP has pretty much uh, collapsed, and so there is yeah. really no, no one except, you know, two, two people who, who won't address the Islamist problem. No, you're right. You know, the, that, that's that's another that, that's another major point when you look at you know after Trump won, it just sort of became clear that um, you know Trump was at an at an advantage because he was ultimately um, the leader of a major party. Now, Pauline Hanson isn't. You know, if Pauline Hanson was in the Liberal Party and he was, or sorry, she she um, was you know leader of the Liberals, and that would give her a distinct advantage. Um, same thing if. Nigel was in the Conservatives, it would give him a distinct advantage. It's not like that, you know, it's, it's complicated. Um, and we don't have that sort of anti-establishment, but, you know, you know, morally superior um, candidate that Donald Trump represented or that, you know, Pauline Hanson represented. Um, so, the, so, so the problem is, you know, that last story isn't there and that's why it's becoming more complex and that's, you know, we're hoping the Conservatives win, but that, that factor isn't present in this election. Uh, we have to remember that in the 2015 general election, the, the polls were wrong. They were wrong about Brexit as well. So yeah, uh, we, yeah. we could have any result, but we, we, we could, will yeah. find out in, in, in a few days uh, where, which, uh, which path the, the UK voters go down. But uh, that's all we've got time for for this week. So thank you once again, Sukath, for being my co-host. It was my pleasure. And of course, uh, I would encourage all of our listeners, to, if, if you haven't yet signed up for the email list at theunshackable.net slash subscribe, we've also uh, redone our Patreon system. So uh, please consider being a patron on Patreon because we've arranged some awesome benefits for uh, our, our supporters. So, make, uh, so if you want to support our work, please do. It helps us uh, expand and you also uh, score some rewards yourself. So it's a win-win situation. And there is also, we're very excited to announce now, Unshackled merchandise is on sale. It's at a new online retailer called the, the Upright Market, which you can uh, access at uprightmarket.com. I'll leave all this on the description in the show notes page. Uh, please uh, remember to subscribe to this podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or view the video version on YouTube. And of course, don't forget to keep checking the unshackled.net on a regular basis for all the latest news. Thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time.